All right, hey guys, I'm Scott Hambrick. You can go check me out at scotthambrick.com and today I wanted to talk about the problem with the idea of problematicism. Uh, on episode 224 of uh, Barbell Logic, we had a, qu uh, a listener that asked a question about bidets and in asking his question, he said that, that, that they were problematic. And then I went on a little rant in that show um, where I said that the word, this is a quote from a show, the word problematic is utter bullshit. Either something is a problem or it is not. You could think that something might possibly be a problem, then you would say, this could be a problem. And this could be a problem when you say problematic, that you impart some nature on the thing that it may not have, in fact. So I had, an, I had a listener email me about this, and I knew I would. Uh, this guy says, hey guys, I love the show, but wanted to point out that your last rant against the word problematic was, ironically, a problem in and of itself. There's no irony in that, by the way. When you set a binary distinction between is and is not in a problem, you are missing the space between where something may or may not be a problem. I want to read that again. He says, when you set a binary distinction between is and it is not, you are missing the space between where something may or may not be a problem. And this is this guy's fundamental error, and this is the problem with the word problematic. The word problematic, the, which is, we're not just talking about the word here either, by the way, we're talking about the concept of problematicism. Um, it's a postmodern word and concept, and it's evil, because there can only be a binary distinction between things that are and are not. If something is, then there is only one other possible state, which is, is not. So something's either a problem or it is not a problem. You know, confusion as to whether something is a problem or not, the confusion about the matter of whether or not something is a problem or not doesn't change the true nature of the thing. So whether you fully understand it or not, um, the nature of the thing still means that it is either truly a problem or it is not a problem. So for anything A, Either anything else is either A or not A. There is no such thing as A-ish, right? Something is either a problem or it is not a problem. There's no such thing as problem-ish. Um, in logic, in classical logic, there's a thing called the law of the excluded middle. And it says everything must either be or not be. There's no missing space between problems and not problems. So. He goes on to say, so he's wrong from the beginning. Metaphysically, things can either be a problem or they are not problems. There is no sort of mid-state. But he goes on to say, sure, you can say something might be a problem, but there's nothing incorrect about using the word problematic. And this is a, this is a typical problem with midwits. Like he's talking about the grammar of the word. Because um, I'm not arguing about grammar. I'm talking about the truth or the metaphysical claim that you make when you use the word problematic. We can use the word correctly in a sentence, um, but the fact that the word is nonsense means that any word, any sentence that contains the word will be nonsense. So I can say something like, um, fish are purple airplanes, and everything in that sentence is grammatically correct, but it's bullshit, and you know it is, because we know something about fish and we know something about airplanes. But these simple sentences like that are like genus differentiating definitions. And when somebody uses a word like problematic and they create sentences that have this sort of definitional character, um, they end up slipping some weaselly ideas past the listener or the reader. If most people don't know what so, for example, people say whiteness is problematic. Well, what's whiteness and then what does problematic mean? But we've already slipped in a definition so that people, people that don't know, people that aren't careful thinkers, people that don't have the philosophical and the logic background uh, hear this, um, it just slips it past the goalie as definitional. Um, and they take it away as fact. Just like you might say that something like squareness is rectangular. That's, uh, that's definitional, and saying using words like problematic in this definitional forms like help people, 
well, it helps brainwash people, frankly. Um, this guy goes on to write that the word has been used since 1609, and I don't care about that. I don't care if people have been using shitty words to uh, insert sneaky reasoning into their in, in, um, rhetoric into their discussions for 400 years. It doesn't matter to me that it's been used a long time. And then he goes on to give me a, a definition. He says, problematic applies especially to things whose existence, meaning fulfillment or realization is highly uncertain. But he cherry-picked the definitions because, well, he cherry-picked it because I looked up in the Oxford English Dictionary the following definition. Problematic. Of the nature of a problem, constituting or presenting a problem. So can something have the nature of a problem and not be a problem? I would say no. Uh, can something can constitute a problem and not be a problem? No. So the word problematic, the word problematic is redundant. We already have a word that stands in for the, uh, for the category of things which cause problems and have a nature of being a problem and constitute problems. And that word is problem. So clear, it's clear to me that the word problematic is used uh, is used to uh, break uh, reality in the mind of the, of the listener, to, inf to put a stigma on socially unacceptable behaviors. People tend to use it in, use it in soci sociology where it's harder to um, you know, make, uh, prove truth claims. Um, I think it's a metaphysical poison. It's a tool of the enemy, the capital E enemy. Uh, I don't think you should use this word. I don't think you should let other people use it. So if somebody around you says that something's problematic, stop them and ask, well, hey, listen, you just said that white, whiteness is problematic, for example. Well, is it really a problem or not? And if they tell you that it is, a, you know, make them label it. And if they label it as a problem, make them explain to you in which ways it is a problem. Because you'll find that often, often, they don't have those reasons. They don't have reasons. They cannot define something as a problem. So they use this sneaky fucking word, problematic, to impart the nature of a problem on things that are not, in fact, problems. It's metaphysical poison. We can't allow people to get away with this. So there's that. There's that rant. Uh, I'll just stick around for just a little bit and see if you guys have any questions about it. Uh, I have a big problem with misuse of language like this. Uh, it's postmodernism, top to bottom. Um, you know, the idea that there isn't a binary between is and is not is a postmodern idea, probably. And uh, uh, if we discard the law that excluded middle, you know, if we discard that law, um, we can't we can't make decisions any further any longer. Or at least we can't make rational ones. We lose the ability to be rational. And uh, you know, the more that people use this word, the more we'll have trouble uh, making those rational, logical decisions. <laughs> Strong Chest says, I agree. Problematic can suck it. <laughs> Good. What else, everybody? Uh, Queener says this live is fire. Well, thank you. Uh, I hope to bring more of these. I, I get I get these uh, emails from listeners of either Online Great Books podcast or um, Barbell Logic podcast, and uh, I'm going to start doing these kind of more well thought out responses to those people and uh, create some more original essays. And I'm going to do some of these lives like this. I'm going to capture the um, the audio and video from the live, push it out to YouTube, BitChute, and so on, and then also a, uh, a uh, Scott Hambrick podcast feed and do uh, short form podcasts on specific things that bug me like this. Anything further guys? I'll take some questions. The word is nails on the chalkboard, Matthew Smith says. The second I hear it, I know you're dealing with a zealot. Well, you know that somebody's trying to uh, they're trying to sneak in some negative connotations to a concept that uh, that they're not probably not ready to support. Uh, so we need to call them out on that. Say, wait a minute, is it a problem or is it not? Is it not a problem? 
one of the things that's happened to me lately, Matthew, is uh, friends of mine, allies of mine, have started using this word, and it has, and that is the thing that I fear the most, is when people who believe there are such things as absolute, is it, there, there is such a thing as absolute truth, and you can make valid truth claims, when they start using this word problematic, they're, um, they're in danger of undermining their own positions and the way they think, and uh, I want I want, I want to stamp this thing out. It is a bad concept. Uh, so, I'm going to start doing this. Uh, I don't know how often I'm going to do this. Uh, hopefully I'll do it weekly or maybe a little more and discuss these things. Um, th th these kinds of topics. I don't really have an outlet for you. know. I don't have an outlet it's not appropriate to talk about these things on Word Bell Logic. It's not appropriate to talk about them on the Online Great Books podcast, maybe. So there are things that are tweeners that uh, I'll cover here on my channel and uh, in, a, in a separate little podcast. Smart Law says, have I seen West Side versus the World? I have seen it. Uh, Trey and I watched it right after, like the day it came out and uh, enjoyed that. I was hoping it would be more about the training methodologies there and kind of, but it was not about that as much as I hoped. It was more about... Um, and personality conflicts and uh, well and about the interpersonal there but it's a good show and if you're into if you're into strength sports then uh, you should go watch it you should watch West Side versus the world well thank you Matthew he says he's looking forward to the podcast yeah well if there's nothing else uh, I'll stick around for just a moment longer and see if I can take any other questions, and then I'll, if nothing else, I'll jump off of there. John says, problematic is a word that seems disassociative. Using it allows the speaker to pass the buck and not accept ownership for helping to solve the issue. Well, I think, mm, I think that's generous of you, John. Uh, I think that's generous of you. Uh, sometimes, sometimes people are using the word problematic to not accept ownership for helping to solve the issue, like you said, but oftentimes, um, I think it's used to stigmatize certain behaviors or attributes. And if somebody says that red hair is problematic, they're, they're trying to, it, they're using rhetoric to make people think that there is some, there, there might be something wrong with being redheaded. And we can't allow them to do that stuff. Matthew says, if we can talk about barbells, how do you help a lifter that has gotten a specific lift in the head? Uh, all of us, I think, from time to time, um, develop some fear and trepidation and problems with some of these, these barbell lifts as they get heavy. Um, the squat, the squat causes me a great deal of trouble. You know, it, I'm, my anthropometry makes my squat very inefficient and miserable and it'll it'll i'll get up in my head I'll, I'll be afraid of it i'll be preoccupied by a heavy squat for a week like if i know that i have to squat 405 for a triple or or something like that it'll bother me and it'll preoccupy my thoughts for five six seven days coming up on that and um In the, in, the, in the squat in particular, there are a few things we can do. I will have somebody who's scared of their squat. Um, I'll have them start doing heavy, heavy squat walkouts. So if a guy was going to squat 405 and was very anxious about it, I might have them walk out 450 or 475 and just stand there with their abs braced and super tight you know, for 20 full seconds and then rack it. I'll prohibit them from bending their knee or their waist, just have them walk out something very heavy. So they start to experience, you know, so the last thing they felt was very, very heavy. And when they unrack their 405, it'll, it'll feel lighter because their last memory was of the very heavy 475 they walked out. Also, also, uh, you know, set the safeties. You might even put a box under them. Not, you know, they're not going to use the box. You don't want them to use the safeties, but they'll have that there in case they need to. And, uh, and uh, psychologically for an amateur lifter to know that those things are there for them can be a big help. Uh, and they're just going to need, they're just going to need to have 
uh, some successes doing those things. The more we do it, the more we do it, the more we can do it. We habituate ourselves into the virtue of facing those fears and we just do it. Yeah. Hello, Miami Barbell. Well, yeah, good afternoon, sir. Well, Saturday afternoon is probably not the best uh, Instagram live time, but uh, thank you guys for coming here. Thank you guys for listening to this. Feel free, <laughs> Queener says, feel free to tell me to shove it if you don't want to turn this into a lifting Q&A. I, that's fine, sir. I'm glad to do it. I've been experiencing very a very tight and stiff low back going through your deadlift form up. Okay. Do you have a question about that? Do you have a question about that? Is this, is this most likely a form problem? Question mark? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, it is normal for any, well, for any trainee that's doing a low bar squat followed by deadlifts to experience a lot of fatigue in their lower back and that's something that's actually desirable that's why we do that's why we do the low bar squat because it requires us to lean over and places all that shear or moment on their back we want to train the back so you're going to experience a great deal of fatigue in the lower back and you may you may um, you may register that as tightness i don't know but i always ask the client do you have a sharper shooting pain you have burning or tingling sensations. Do you have numbness uh, in your extremities? And if you don't, uh, and if you don't have any of those things, then it's just discomfort, it's just fatigue probably, and you press on. Uh, dehydration can cause some back spasms and some problems there. Uh, so make sure you're, you're make sure you're hydrated well. It's you know it's a big problem right now. It's hot. It's hot. Late summer. Carl with the K says. For a late intermediate trainee, do you ever put someone on 8x3, 6x4, 5x5, 6x5 before moving the volume day weight up? Does the intensity increase weekly with those jumps? <clears throat> yeah, I often, I often will, uh, the intensity doesn't always increase on volume day. How about that? It doesn't always increase on volume day. Um, we run into a problem we run into a problem, like for example, let's say if a guy's going to squat 405 for five on his intensity day and his volume day is, um, is 335, let's say, and he misses 405 and he does it for three. Well, if we, if we have him next week try to repeat that 405 and, and add a rep or maybe add two reps, but we, when we bump up the work that he does on volume day, you'll find that the spread between his volume work and his intensity work starts to collapse and that can be a problem particularly for ladies and for older people, the, the spread between their volume and their intensity works very small anyway because of their, the problems with uh, neuromuscular efficiency that they have. So I'm always trying to protect the spread between the volume and the intensity work. So I'll often you know, add work, add sets and reps, and actually drop the weight or leave it the same because we need to keep that spread open So because it gives us more uh, training possible and gives us more fl programming flexibility. I'm sorry you had to uh, bail on that session, sir. Um, I don't know what that means, Carl. Yeah, it felt like fatigue, Queener says about this lower back tightness. That's probably what it was. Uh, Harbed says, I don't know if you talked about building a lifting platform on here, but I remember on BLC. One different from Brett McKay's. You know, mine is different from Brett's. Um, mine is T-shaped. Um, my 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 rack is bolted to the floor. The platform is has been. I you know, slid it up into the rack, um, and then, then the uh, horizontal part of the T uh, constitutes the lifting platform in front of the thing. And uh, my platform is not screwed together. Uh, it has a two before um, border around it that uh, holds the plywood and the uh, horse stall mats all in there in the uh, in that border like a tray so that uh, 
the stuff doesn't slide around and horse stall mats don't move. And then I can also, tr I can also uh, take the horse stall mats out and go hose them off if I want to. I can replace the, uh, the hard maple top that we, that we stand on uh, without removing any screws or anything like that. So it's not screwed together. Just the frame is screwed together. I built the things. My dad and I built them. We don't have any drawings. We just we just whipped them up and, and built them on a Saturday. And, um, maybe I'll make a post about those someday. Probably need to. What else? Anything else? Meager Findings says, thank you for everything you do, Scott. Thank you, sir. Barbell life has changed your life. Well, thank you, man. I've noticed you squat pretty close to the wall, wondering how you keep your eyes consistently in the same spot so close. I don't think about it. You, know, you don't have to, you, you don't have to uh, fix your eye gaze. You could just, like, try to keep your neck neutral. You know, you could, you could do that. Uh, thank you, sir. Ritz says, yeah. Uh, John says he has plenty of BDE today. That's good. Good. You need to be able to move your platform around, Ed. Yeah. Yeah, you can move this one around. You can take it apart without any tools. Uh, you can, you can you know, pull the plywood and everything out of the uh, frame without any tools. Lean it against the wall, move the frame, and put the stuff back in it. And uh, yeah, no tools necessary. Well, I think that's enough for today. Thank you guys for coming to this. I'll be posting it. I'll be posting it on my YouTube channel uh, at Scott, which is, uh, you can find my username there. It's Scott Hambrick. I'll put it on, I'll put it, uh, I'll put it on BitChute. Um, and then come Tuesday, uh, I'll be putting it on also on the scotthambrick.com. And then I will also plan it, uh, be putting it out as a podcast soon, soon as well. Save your questions uh, for the next session, guys. Watch out for it. I will, uh, I will eventually uh, beat out a regular schedule so you can bring your questions. And we'll have a regularly scheduled meeting time, and I'll have a topic of the day, and uh, you can bring, bring your, your free-form questions, and we'll cover those at the end of the, at the, end of the thing. So thank you guys for listening, and uh, have a great Saturday and a good Labor Day weekend. Talk to you soon.